screen um, that there is a Q&A box there. Um, so please do add any questions um, that you have for today's speakers in there. Um, we, this is live, so we will be um, encouraging you to post as many questions as you can for our panel. Um, and I will also be recording this session um, so that um, we can share this with you afterwards. Um, but with that, I will hand over to you, Emma. Thank you very much. Um, and good morning, everyone. And sorry about the technical difficulties, um, but do, welcome to the virtual event, focusing on all things audience addressability. For those of you that I, I haven't yet met, my name is Owen Newman and I am Pubmatics CRO for EMEA and I will be moderating the discussion this morning. Now, it seems as though hardly a day goes by when there isn't some kind of announcement surrounding changes to identity and audience addressability. Either the cookies finally crumbled, you know, there's been changes to app tracking, GDPR, which seems like old news now, first party versus third party, email hashing, contextual versus explicit, probabilistic versus deterministic, the list seems endless and frankly it can be confusing and it can feel as though the landscape is literally shifting under our feet. So with all this going on, what does the new age buying environment look like and how are brands and publishers finding and engaging with their audiences? Today I'm delighted uh, to be joined by a panel of leading experts in their field who will share their valuable insights on how industry partners work together to solve the audience addressability challenge. So on that note, let me introduce our speakers. This morning, we'll be hearing from Dennis Palmer, Global Director, Channel Partnerships at Zeotap, Stefan Kukic, Data Strategy Director at Mindshare, and Jay Fowder, European Director of Product at Sandler TV. So if I may, I'd like to start by asking each of our panelists to briefly share what audience addressability means to them and their organizations. Stefan, perhaps I could ask you to kick this one off. Sure, um, just wanna say thanks for having me, really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, looking forward to the session. So I guess for me, um, I think for advertisers, I believe that it means how can we take the data uh, that they have um, on their consumers and ensure that they can be targeted uh, with the right message at the right time in the most compliant and unintrusive way. Um, and this could be simply via sort of one-to-one -one marketing, which we've been doing for quite some time now, or leveraging new technology, for example, um, ID targeting and things like that, where we can start to target them across the open web. So I think that for me personally, anyway, is what I deem to be um, sort of audience addressability and things like that, and, and utilizing all the tech that we have to ensure that we can really start to target these users in a world um, that doesn't rely so much on third party cookies. So that's kind of simply put in, in, a, in a nutshell what I think in the end. Thanks, Stefan. Dennis, what about you? Yes, I think the technical difficulties we have at the start is a great metaphor for the lack of good effective audience addressability and, and show some of the pitfalls. So I think, you know, at Zeotap, we're a customer intelligence platform. We work with brands and publishers to help predict customer behavior and target customers with the right message at the right time. So for example, an automotive brand will know who's been driving their cars for the last five years, the new model is out, they want to reach them with an offer for a test drive. It's then imperative that they get the right customer and it's actually someone who has been a customer of theirs for the past five years. Similarly with insurance, at renewal season, if a product is up for renewal, customers have been with a certain company for 11 months, they want to be able to target that user with the renewal offer and make sure that they're not hitting customers that are completely irrelevant. Uh, and the most simple use case is basic suppression. If someone is a customer already, don't serve them ads and offers specifically targeted to new customers. It's just gonna be a poor experience and annoy people if they've bought broadband for 30 pounds a month and then they see an offer for 20 pounds a month as an example. Especially if it's from the company that they've just bought the broadband from. <laughs> um, Jay, over to you. Yeah, I think Stefan and, and Dennis have done a good job of sort of covering it broadly. I guess, um, you know, when we come at this from a, a TV point of view, um, you know, our audiences are people sat in front of their TV screens and they're watching video content. And what we know about those audiences is that their time and their viewership is becoming more and more fragmenting over an evolving and complex video landscape. We know that advertisers want to market to these audiences and they're finding it increasingly harder to reach them because of this fragmentation. 
And then you've got this added complexity that quite a few of these platforms um, that are drawing the eyeballs are non ad supporting. So, you know, that, that covers the audience. And then, you know, the addressability side of that, I mean, addressability is, is exactly kind of as, as Dennis and Stefan mentioned. It's about um, creating the relevancy of the ad and the efficiency of which that advertising is delivered. So, you know, we collect TV data that allows advertisers to complement their, their TV media plans. And that could be through personalization of a digital ad because of potentially a TV program that, that person may have seen or even optimizing frequency of their digital campaign because the user may have already been exposed to the advertiser's TV ad already. Thank you. Well, I think that's kind of set the scene for the rest of the conversation. So thank you very much. Um, one of the earliest and most critical decisions that both buyers and publishers need to make is which of the many audience targeting and identity solutions do they invest in? What are the key factors that need to be taken into consideration and is it better to build or buy? Stefan, my share having invested in this area. It would be interesting if you could share your thought process around your approach and the impact your solution has had on your customers and your business. Sure. So we've been kind of plotting and planning on how we can start to leverage some of these ID solutions over the past year or so. Um, we're now kind of just going into a testing phase, which is going to be quite interesting. And we've decided to kind of split this up into two phases. So, you know, as, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware, there are quite a few ID solutions available in the market or will be available soon, which is great from a buyer's perspective. Choice is always a wonderful thing, right? However, I don't think it's possible for you to work with every single provider. I think it comes to the point where you need to maybe look at a couple and then start testing to see, okay, who, who are the top three or the top five ID partners that you can work with potentially on a global scale that have the ability to match your first party data. So that could be for the time being your cookie based device ID based data. And more importantly, <clears throat> excuse me, your addressable data. So email addresses, mobile phone numbers and things like that. And then for those that don't have too much first party data, then it becomes imperative that the provider that you choose has a robust set of audience targeting options, whether that be probabilistic or deterministic um, sort of data sets that you can pick up and assign to your digital campaigns. So the first phase is taking your potential first party data that you have, using that or matching that with partners such as Zeotap or LiveRamp or Permitive, for example, seeing uh, is there sort of any audience correlation can you then take that and then push that into your relevant media buying platforms for buying? And then the second phase, which will probably happen maybe a little bit later this year, is can you start to work with other providers, other ID providers such as Lotomy and their Panorama ID, for example? Can you start to take that and implement that into your media buying, um, into, your, into your DSPs, for example, as you do today, standard third-party data segments? So the idea is to see you know, can these IDs actually function in a similar way to what we've been doing over the past couple of years using third party data segments, just click, select, add to your campaign and off you go. Are the cost efficiencies there? Is the scale there? So I think, again, purely from our sort of mind share perspective, and that's kind of the two pronged approach that we're kind of going with, ensuring that we can use first party data with these ID solutions. And then can we just use a whole range of ID solutions going forward once they've been integrated uh, more so on, on the SSP and the, on the SSPs and the demand side platforms as well. So that's kind of where we are at the moment, uh, looking to get some tests up and running and hopefully have some interesting results maybe by the end of Q2, uh, Q3. Okay. And Dennis, when you're speaking to publishers and buyers about this, what are the key things you recommend that they take into consideration and what role do ID solutions play here? Yeah, it's a great question. I think there's no one size fits all answer, sadly. I think Echoing Stefan's point, while we have an ID solution, it's deterministic, it's based on matching definitive users from brands with publishers, we're very much aligned with Stefan's view that there's probably going to be five or six, seven or eight ID solutions in the market, both from a scale perspective and, and a global perspective. You know, there might be one dominant partner in Europe that's not going to give coverage in APAC, and similarly, a US partner might, might not provide the rest of the global coverage. So I think publishers really need to consider what what they're looking for is it accuracy in which case they want a deterministic id solution which would rely on login data so we've seen recently a lot of publishers 
putting up paywalls potentially, or even just free registrations, trying to explain the value. Here's why we need you to log in so that we can serve more effective ads. But that's not going to be feasible for all, all publishers. So I think it really is publishers need to look at what are their goals, which brands are they working with, and then which ID solutions are going to supplement that alongside other targeting capabilities like contextual, which again, some contextual, some publishers will have great contextual opportunity. You know, in the travel sphere, if you're writing a review about a particular destination, it's a prime opportunity to show hotels for that destination. But for news content, for example, it's very hard to target to the story and there can be negative contextual associations. So, so for publishers with large volumes of traffic that are able to get a value exchange that can get login, certainly a deterministic solution might be the way to go. But I, I, we'd advise very much just testing, seeing what's out there and also being mindful of what is gonna bring the advertiser demand. It's great partnering with solutions, but if there's no advertisers on the end of it and it's not gonna be a seamless transition, you may have wasted your time in integrating that. So I think the big things are, what is it that you're looking to achieve? What are your KPIs? And which solutions are going to give you the advertiser scale, demand, regional coverage that you're looking for? And also being very mindful of privacy, compliance, and checking all that as well. Mm. Um, of course, using data in workflows to increase the ROI of media buying isn't new. We've been doing it ever since the internet started. Um, Jay, Sanga TV has been at the forefront of utilizing TV viewership data to increase the return of media investment. Could you walk us through the stages of your evolution in this area? What have you learned? What would you do differently? What do you need and from whom um, to improve in this area? Yeah, sure. So um, almost 10 years ago, uh, we started a process of integrating our automatic content recognition software into the chipset of TV brands globally. And really what that allows us to do is understand content that's being watched on the TV screen in real time, regardless of the source. And why that's of interest to advertisers and from a media investment point of view, um, you know, it goes back to what I was talking about earlier with eyeballs switching between screens, advertisers are faced with a number of challenges, namely things like reach and frequency. So it's a big challenge for TV advertisers to reach their audiences because of the sheer vast amounts of choice that consumers now have to watch video content. You've got people watching binging series on Netflix, um, watching football on Amazon Prime or films on Disney Plus. So it's becoming more and more difficult for advertisers to get their TV ads in front of these consumers. And then you know, the advertisers have to think about when they are in front, you know, when they do have the opportunity to present an ad in front of you know, what we class as an elusive viewer, um, how can they control and measure the frequency across all their screens to ensure a positive brand experience? So our evolution has kind of followed the trend of the growth in consumer choice. So you know, everyone's seen the, the, the sort of subscription charts from Netflix and Amazon, our growth has kind of followed that nicely as well. Um, and you know, that leads us to, to the now and, and today. And actually we, we've uh, announced about an hour ago uh, our partnership with you guys, Emma, uh, Pubmatic, to deliver our TV audience targeting solution into Pubmatic's programmatic supply um, across European uh, large markets. I guess what, what I've learned um, from this, this growth and this evolution is you, know, you can't take anything away from TV. TV is still a fantastic medium for advertising and building a connection with consumers and you know, that kind of storytelling element of advertising but using TV data can be a powerful tool to you know, bridge the gap between the big screen and digital devices. And it can really help advertisers plan, execute, and measure their advertising holistically across devices. In, in terms of challenges and, and you know, what we need, et cetera, you know, one of the challenges is measurement around wall gardens. Um, so whether that be you know, the big social media platforms or, or even broadcaster apps, Advertisers want to understand their marketing plans across all platforms and all publishers. And today that's something that isn't made, um, made very easy. So you know, a bit more cooperation from those guys around measurement would be, would be kind of welcomed. Yeah. Um, that's Google's most recent announcement that they will not use third party identifiers across their own ad stack and browser to track and measure user behavior from next year onwards. 
Has that accelerated the need for buyers and sellers to create a robust cookie list advertising ecosystem? Jay, as you're in front of me, I'm going to direct that one to you first, and then obviously I'll ask um, Stefan and Dennis to, to chip in with their thoughts as well. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think it, it's it's worth not forgetting that it's been over a year since Safari started blocking third party cookies. Um, so the concept around this has been uh, has been around for a while. But I think because Chrome and, and Google's got the biggest market share out there, you're right. This is an announcement that has accelerated everyone to think more about identity and you know, what happens in a post ad cookie world. And you know, I think it is moving the buy side and sell side to take back control um, of their consumer relationships by creating um, these first party relationships, both with, you know, from the publisher side, with their site visitors, and from a brand and advertiser side with their consumers. And I think, you know, Dennis mentioned it from the, from the publisher side, some, some publishers are gonna do really well at this and some may not. Um, you know, I think from an advertiser perspective, I think e-commerce verticals will do very well at um, you know, kind of creating that first party relationship with consumers, but some, some verticals will suffer. Um, you know, I don't know many people that are gonna sign up for updates on you know, chewing gum or, or cleaning products, et cetera. So advertisers are gonna to have to get creative and smart about how they engage with their customers. I think most importantly, when they, how they engage with them in a positive way. Mm. Um, Stefan? Uh, basically, I agree with what Jay said. Um, <clears throat> it's pretty much gotten everyone into gear um, to really think about their solutions. And I think a lot of people actually panicked a little bit and they thought, well, what about, you know, we've been hearing about all these great identity solutions what happens if we try and use it in DB360 or within the Google tech stack? Um, so as far as I'm aware, I think it should still be good to use. Maybe just don't, um, maybe exclude Google's ad exchange from the buying. Um, obviously leverage Pubmatic um, to get some of those identity solutions into those platforms as well to ensure that everything is running as smooth as possible. Um, and I think that as, as Jay mentioned, it's, it's a good thing that people are now starting to take power back into their hands really and not, and not kind of be beholden to the walled gardens. Um, so I think it's nice that everyone is going to have plenty of options. Uh, like I said, there's going to be a massive focus on first party data, so addressable data and things like that, using identity solutions. Um, and I believe there's also going to be a massive, massive uh, boost in contextual targeting, already working with a couple of partners on that as well, to kind of help mitigate some of the damage of, of not having third party cookies anymore. So yeah, I definitely think it's a good thing. And I'm glad that now people are really starting to, to think about what they can do in the next six to 12 months and how they can start to figure out the best ways of targeting users. Yeah, you've both of you have touched on a couple of points. We've got a couple of questions coming in. So um, Dennis, I'm going to let you answer the Google question first, and then if you don't mind, I'm going to jump to a couple of the audience Q&A, because I think it's pertinent to what we've just been discussing here. So Dennis, just your view on um, the Google question that I raised a second ago. Sure, and I think it's a fantastic time to be outside of the wall gardens, because the opportunity for collaboration has just accelerated. And it, you know, from partners that we've been speaking to, they're just so much more willing to embrace and start testing new solutions. Uh, we've seen a lot of uptake and interest in first party data. So brands that have been able to build customer relationships that have details that know about their customers, being able to activate that across publisher sites is a big, big focus. So a lot of brands I think are, are trying to activate and work with their first party data more effectively. In the case that Jay mentioned of CPG brands, for instance, they don't always have a direct to consumer relationship. And so this is where publishers can really come in and be helpful. They, through their potentially login walls or subscriptions or registrations can capture some information about consumers and then help that match it to the brand. So I think absolutely great time and a lot of, lot of interest in what can be done with first party and collaborative data. Perfect, thank you. Um, actually, while I've got you there live, Dennis, if you, uh, so to speak, one of the questions that's coming from the audience is around the adoption of ID solutions. Um, are you seeing any barriers to publishers, and maybe Stefan, I'll ask you from a buying perspective as well, to the adoption of ID solutions? And if so, how are you, how are you helping publishers overcome those? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think one of the barriers is first understanding and knowledge of the ID solutions. I think it's important to, you know, I touched on the point earlier, understand, is it deterministic? Is it going to be matching one-to-one -one with brands? Is it probabilistic? Is there a lot of scale? What is the coverage? Is this going to cover me in just the UK or will it cover France, Germany? Are publishers looking for an international 
footprint. I think just the sheer number of ID solutions that are out there is causing a little bit of, I don't want to say saturation, but a knowledge saturation, trying to understand what the benefits are and why, why one should be adopted over the other. And also the barriers are, you know, it'd be great to test all, but I think on publisher side, resources are limited. Technical implementation, they do involve a little bit of code, a little bit of privacy, security, compliance steps to go through. So I think it's important to, to choose wisely and get it down to those five or six that Stefan was alluding to earlier in trying to get the most impact out of the audiences that publishers do have with the fewest possible number of ID solutions. Mm. We have a solution for that, but this is not a sales pitch. But if anybody wants to know what it is, you can DM me after. Um, Stefan, how about you? What are you What are you hearing from buyers around? You know, is, is there reluctance in this area? So I think a lot of people are keen on the ID solutions. I think some of the biggest barriers are scale at the moment. That's something that we are concerned about, um, which is why we are looking to push some of the testing back into Q Q four once. Like I said earlier, once more the ID solutions have been implemented into more demand side platforms and into the SSPs as well. Um, so, and I think also uh, along with scale, cost as well. So, if you're lacking in scale, then cost tends to go up as well, and things like that. And also um, having enough first party data as well to use with those ID solutions, as I mentioned in, in the kind of the two phase approach. So, I think a lot of people want to test it, but it's just kind of wait and see. Um, how the adoption process is done and how feasible it is to actually, can you actually take those IDs and actually spend in full your, your daily budgets, your monthly budgets and things like that and not worry about underspending on your campaigns mm -hmm. and things like that. But obviously the guys at Zeotap and, and a couple of the other partners are obviously working really closely with the publishers to ensure that we can get as much data as possible. And there was a really interesting fact actually from Permitive, uh, who is one of the partners that we're looking to work with. And that they're saying that the current sort of addressable audience size is actually only really five to 10% of the entire open web and the rest of the 90% is potentially anonymous, which is where the third party cookie has been helping us, right? In terms of finding uh, the right people to target and things like that. Now, without third party cookies, again, they become completely anonymous. So what may happen, and what has already started to happen is the publishers might then start to ask people to log into more of the websites, which is a good and a bad thing, potentially depending on who you are if you feel like you have to log in every single time you want to view some content but again that might be more beneficial for more addressable targeting and also to improve the viability of id solutions again this is just pure theory on my part at the moment so um from a buyer side as again just to reiterate it's just i think scale um and proof of concept i think are the biggest barriers to, to adoption at the moment what about just to highlight on Stephens, if i may addressability point i think it's important to note that the third party cookies they just affect mobile web and desktop at the moment. So there are also in-app traffic that, that may come under scrutiny with, but you know, at the moment iOS, iOS 14 has pulled in consent notices, but the third party cookies do only affect mobile web and desktop. There is a huge wealth of addressable audiences available through in-app connected TV and other solutions that I'm sure Jay will, will elaborate on as well. Well, actually Jay, why? Why don't you elaborate? This is yeah, I, I mean, I guess I, 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 just to add to that point, I mean, e even though uh, the announcement was coming from Chrome, they, you know, they have proposed a solution in place already um, known as Flock. Um, and actually what that does is kind of group cohorts of people together. So it yeah. will still hopefully allow kind of interest-based advertising, but um, kind of more, more group targeting so that the users can remain um, you know, sort of semi-anonymous. Um, you know, in terms of, in terms of the TV, you know, we are, we're quite lucky in that um, we do have a very stable identifier for TVs. It's, you know, TVs are connected um, and they send an IP address back to, to you know, our servers. So we're quite fortunate that our identifier is something that's stable and we're getting a signal from that, you know, consistently. So I think we're, you know, we've got that first party relationship with the consumer. Um, and I guess we're less worried about identity than potentially others who, who play in the third party space. Thank you. Um, Stefan, just a question around contextual data and contextual targeting. What's the, you know, what's, what role is that going to play um, moving forward? How, how, I guess, how much interest are you having um, around targeting contextually? Because it sort of went away with the party cookies and now obviously there's an, there's an option for it to come back. Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of interest, um, a resurgence in, in, in contextual interest. I mean, personally, I've always used it back in my media buying days. I always found it to be useful to have, 
you know, as separate line items, strategies in your media buying campaigns. But you're right, it did kind of fall off um, as we got more third party data that was deterministic. Um, and now that all these announcements have happened, we are now starting to work very closely with partners such as Peer39, with Captify, with Grapeshot, and they're helping us to build contextual segments that we can then use to target across a wide variety of our clients and campaigns. So yes, there is a big renewed focus. I think that is that is something that people should start to use more often because at the end of the day, you're still more likely to hit a relevant audience when they're browsing specific content and things like that. So I myself, you know, I browse a lot of technology gaming sites and things like that. So if I start to see ads for the latest tech, the latest phones, the latest laptops uh, and things like that, whilst I'm browsing these websites, that makes sense to me. So I think people definitely need to start working with more of these partners. And if you're locked into the wall gardens, then definitely, you know, for example, if you're using DB360 quite a lot, definitely leverage the Google data. I know some people might have their thoughts about that, um, but it's just making sure that you've got enough options in the walled gardens and outside of the walled gardens as well for your contextual targeting needs. Do you think that there's just a, a bit of a follow-up there? Do you think that, you know, there's a different type of targeting that's more, I guess, relevant for a, for a for format type? So, for example, contextual for video versus, you know, something else? Or do you think, you think it can, it doesn't really matter? Um... Gosh, that is a really good question. I think, yes, I think specific formats will definitely help. So for example, if you're looking at your high impact formats and things like that, um, let's say, you know, we got InSkin, Sublime Skins and all those kind of guys. Yes, they have uh, their specific recommended formats, there's some recommended channels or their sites that you can start to target. So I think in that aspect, uh, yes, formats become key in terms of hitting your target and engaging your audience a little bit more than your kind of just standard display and video that you might just have sort of run on network or on a specific site list and things like that. Um, so I think, yes, it's good to have as many of these options as possible, budget dependent. Yeah, always budget dependent. <laughs> um, just going to just sort of change tack a little bit. A uh, question for you, Jay, just around publisher alliances, actually. What do you, what, you know, how do you feel about publisher alliances? What would be required in your opinion to make one truly sustainable? We sort of seen them a few years ago flourish and then sort of drop off the radar, but you know, definitely I, I see them, I see them coming back certainly across Europe, a couple in the UK as well. Yeah, um, I think, you know, I think the, the publishers are seeing the wall gardens take their lunch, right? And so, you know, I think there's a feeling from those guys that together they're stronger and, you know, potentially, cost, et cetera, and resource around creating identity solution individually is, is painful. So, um, you know, I think there is, a, there is a benefit for these guys coming together. Um, and you've got the likes of, you know, the Ozone Project that is, is an example of a very successful publisher alliance. Um, you know, it would be interesting to see whether more publishers join that or whether you know, other alliances form together. And I guess, Dennis, you'll probably know from, more from the publisher side. Yeah, I think one of the challenges we've seen, you know, the alliances are great to echo Jay's point, but they tend to be localized to one market, like a UK alliance, a German alliance in the form of NetID. And a lot of the big international brands tend to op operate at a European or a global level. So I think for an alliance to really take off, it would have to be at the very least pan-European, maybe not global, but, you know, so that a brand looking to target their audience doesn't need to go and Put in place relationships locally across the UK, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, the rest of Europe, etc. One alliance that could give good pan-European, even global coverage would be ideal. Thank you. Um, actually, Dennis, while, while I've got you here, if trust is the central guiding principle for users when deciding who and how they will allow their data to be used online, how do we as an industry go about earning that? Well, I guess, re-earning the trust of our users? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I think there is a certainly a stigma around data. You know, as, as soon as users hear data or targeting, alarm bells ring, and there have been some horror stories and documentaries all about how data is used inefficiently. Personally, I'm a very firm believer that if a brand or a publisher uses data in the right way, it can only be a positive experience. But I think uh, consumers tend to be oblivious to that. Like one, one example I like to highlight is that when I went to visit Blenheim Palace, which is a lovely stately home and the birthplace of Winston Churchill, I signed up for my ticket and left my email address. 
Three months later then, I was out on the open web and saw an advert for an Elton John concert at Blenheim Palace at a very reasonable price. And, you know, did I go, oh, how dare you? What are you doing with my data? That's really intrusive and annoying. No, I was like, this is brilliant. I'm going to go and see that. You know, in the same way, if someone's a football fan or wants to go to Wimbledon or is an opera fan, are they going to be annoyed when, when they get an ad for Wimbledon tickets or when their football team or favourite theatre shows them a great discount? They're not going to say, oh, what are you doing with my data? That's really annoying. They're going to be, this is brilliant. I can't wait to go and see what I'm interested in. And I think it, it's about making that value exchange clearer and highlighting more of the positives rather than just annoying, irrelevant ads that follow us around from brands that we've never interacted with or don't have a relationship with. Yeah, thank you. Actually, you've brought me to, it was going to be my closing question, but I think I'm going to ask it now. Um, and it's for all three of you. So it's a two-parter, so pay attention. First part is, do we think consumers understand the value exchange between them and a publisher? So for example, the content they access for free is funded by the advertising they see. And if not, how do we as an industry do a better job of messaging this? And the second part is, do we think consumers understand the impact on their experience of not providing some degree of targeting consent or capability? Um, Jay, can I pass that one to you first? Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, I, I think you hear a lot of these, um, these conferences, you know, this sort of broad statement that consumers don't understand the value exchange. And I, I think it's, it, it is quite a broad statement to say that, you know, there are good examples out there of where um, you know, consumers are starting to understand that value exchange. I think The Guardian is a great example where you know, they've got about a million readers who regularly contribute towards their um, support journalism programme. And if you think you know, a bit bigger, going back to TV, Netflix has got over 200 million subscribers worldwide who pay for content. Disney Plus have got 100 million. And both of these two platforms don't have traditional advertising models yet. So you, know, you can see that the seeds are being planted in consumers' heads by these platforms that, um, you know, that will contribute towards the broader education piece. Um, there's also, uh, there's something that I'm just keeping an eye on, which is, is quite interesting. Um, there's an interesting project being overseen by Tim Berners-Lee called Project Solid. Um, and the aim of the project is to put personal data in the hands of the consumer and not the platforms. And personally, I think it's got the, uh, the potential to be very game changing. And you know, if you would bet the farm on anyone, um, you know, changing the way people view consumer data, you'd bet it on the guy who invented the internet, right? Um, so you know, he's, it's a very interesting project to follow. At, at the kind of Samba, we've always had that first party relationship with consumers. And so we've had to balance you know, privacy and what the value is for the consumer. And just to give you an example, you know, we do that in two ways. So we do have a privacy center, you know, similar to, to Project Solid, but it's, it's inbuilt into the TV that allows a user to control their, their data in, in the connected TV world. And then I think this, this cool feature that we, that we released is sort of a, a different example of a value exchange um, it's a feature we, we released called Picture Perfect, where the consumer consents to their, their um, content and data being collected. And with the technology that we have um, and AI, we understand the content that's being watched on the TV and improve their TV viewing experience in real time. So you've probably seen things like sports mode or movie mode. And what our feature does is automatically adjust the TV, TV picture settings to optimize the viewing experience. So again, it's just a slightly different value exchange to your typical sort of free content for advertising. Thanks. Uh, Stefan, what's your view around the consumer and their understanding of the value exchange and also the potential impact on their advertising experience if they don't share data of some kind? Uh, so yeah, I think the sentiment is the same. Sadly, no. You know, I think the, the vast majority of consumers don't understand the exchange, hence the mass adoption of ad blockers uh, over the last decade or so. I know that some sites attempt to explain the value exchange, especially if you're running an ad blocker, they say, hey, look, you know, if you turn it off, this massively helps us and allows us to, to do advertising and keep our site running and things like that. But obviously, I presume a lot of people still block it regardless. Um, but I think there just needs to be a wider general public education piece on that, if that's even possible, to really make them understand that it's you know, the online ego. This is how it functions. You've technically viewed this content for free. And I don't think a lot of people actually understand that, that when you're going to a website, you know, the publishers, they have to make their money somehow. So 
again, I hope it's possible, but there has to be a way to educate the masses um, to, to ensure that they kind of understand how everything works. And to your second point, again, a similar situation, the general public don't fully understand the situation. Again, they see the words tracked uh, and things like that, and immediately alarm bells start to ring, and then they reject all forms of consent, and that can potentially ruin their online experience without them even knowing it. Uh, because they, at some point, they'll start to see receive non-relevant ads. Um, so again, it's it's just a massive education piece to understand that it's actually necessary um, for us to be able to understand what your interests are, what you like, and things like that. So we can actually show you things that you will like, and not just receive random things that have no meaning for you, which will then in turn make you hate online advertising even more. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really hoping there is a way that we can kind of educate everyone so they can understand that a little bit better. I think we could really, being as we are, you know, the advertising industry, but let's see. Um, Dennis, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I think sometimes we take it for granted working within the industry that consumers do understand it. And, you know, it's so obvious that this is free because of the advertising. I think what would be wonderful to see as an A-B test is if consumers were asked to pay £10 a month to view that content or get free advertising, which would it be? But sadly, I don't think publishers are in a position to, to risk losing those users and running that test. So I think I, 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 I certainly agree with Stefan that it has been an issue and people... I would like to think that it is slowly getting better with like the notices that are coming up with publishers even going so far as blocking their content unless an ad blocker is switched off. I, I think there is slowly an awareness building. The big irony sadly is that with the giant international conglomerates, the wall gardens and the massive retailers, consumers happily give their data and consent to everything just to see the latest photos or late, have the latest product serve. But with the smaller publishers that are going to be most impacted with this, consumers tend to be a little bit more skeptical and they're like, well, I'm not going to read this article. I'll just move on to the next one that isn't asking me for my personal details, etc. So I think certainly education would be great. And certainly for publishers that aren't massive international wall garden conglomerates, the ability to put forward that understanding and help them also participate and benefit and provide those experiences that Jay and Stefan mentioned. Perfect. Now, that was actually going to be my last question um but the reason i bumped it is because one has come in that's frankly better than mine so from the audience so i thought i would finish on that one um if that's possible who do we think and this is a question for all three of you um who do we think has has got has potentially got the most to lose and who will potentially gain the most in a cookie list environment uh dennis that is a, a little bit of a loaded question. I wouldn't want to to, to, to put anyone under it. I, I, you know, the first, the first instinct is to say the wall gardens, the one that do recognize have the potential to gain massively because they will still have those relationships, get the login details and be able to target effectively. And so the potential to lose the most, I think is publishers on the open web that aren't capturing those details that aren't able to re-identify users as sad as that is. And I, I think it's also worth highlighting that a lot of the solutions we've discussed, they can all, operate in tandem. It isn't necessarily a one or the other. You know, you can have contextual advertising along with the probabilistic ID, along with the deterministic ID. It, it doesn't have to be one over all others. And so it's best to start learning. But I think unless publishers that aren't currently capturing details or aren't able to build effective audiences, I think they, as it currently stands, would stand to lose the most. And the most, again, is walled gardens and potentially other channels like CTV, in-app traffic, or channels that are able to identify users. Thank you. Jay? Yeah, I definitely agree with CTV being a, a, a winner. Um, you know, I think Dennis is right. It's the, the, the biggest winners will be the walled gardens. Um, and, you know, the losers will be the, the, the smaller publishers that can't gain that relationship with consumers. Um, I think what, what will probably be interesting is you know to see how the brands uh, attack this. You know, as I said, some some won't be able to gain those uh, relationships with consumers. Um, and I think we already talked about another big winner. I think the contextual companies, um, you know, the Pier Thirty Nines, Grape Shots, etc. You know, having having a comeback, uh, that there'll be another winner. I can see them definitely, um, you know, being part of the future. But I guess it's also, you know, there's this kind of apocalypse that everyone thinks is coming. 
you know, we all thought the same thing when mobile was around, right? You know, everyone was like petrified about how we're gonna track across mobile and desktop. And we got through it, right? Um, I think GDPR was another one we all got very scared about. You know, there were a few casualties, but you know, on, on the whole, most people got through it. So you know, my, my personal feeling is I think, I think we will get through it. Um, you know, the, the guys who potentially have the most to lose, hopefully won't lose as much. They'll, they'll figure out you know, the right solution or the right approach. Yeah, I think you made a really good point there. We've, as an industry, have gone through numerous, I think didn't somebody called it the adpocalypse once when ad blockers came out. So, you know, and we've got time. So, you know, there is time to, I think you've all referenced test and learn. Um, don't leave it to the last minute. Um, you know, and so there is there is still time as an industry to to come, you know, to come up with something that um that you know that's a, that's a positive out of all of this. Um, Stefan, what, what are your thoughts about the winners and the losers? Pretty much exactly what, what they've said. You know, the figuratively speaking, the little guys always kind of lose out in these situations. Um, but I'm hoping that they can maybe offer some solid value exchange uh, to their user base. And again, I'm not just talking about your standard sign up for our newsletter just because you landed on our website. You know, really trying to give them something that will make them hand over their personal detail, their email address, their phone number and things like that, which then they can start to use and then leverage uh, with ID solutions and things like that. So, you know, fingers crossed for them. But yes, at the moment, they do seem like the ones that will suffer the most. But like I said, with, with a good value exchange strategy, I think that they can they can weather the storm, basically. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so I would we're at the end of our time. Uh, again, apologies to everyone for the for the Zoom hiccups, but you know it's bound to happen. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our panelists for their candid contributions and for me throwing some unscripted questions at them. So you handled that incredibly well. Um, and I'd also like to encourage anyone who is interested in not only discovering more about this topic, um, but who is prepared to get actively involved in shaping the future of audience addressability to reach out to the IAB Europe um, and then get involved in one of their task force. I'd also like to thank the IAB Europe today for hosting us here um, and uh, I'll hand the mic back to Helen. Hi, yes, thank you so much, Emma. It was a really great, great session and thank you um, to all, our, all the panelists that participated as well. Some really great and insightful um, segments there, so thank you. Um, again, as Emma said, apologies for the slight technical difficulties at the beginning, but we're Pleased to have you all with us um, and join us today, so thank you for joining. We have recorded the session, so we will also share um, that with you all after this. Um, but with that, I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.